underway. We're eight minutes behind. So this is a sixth. I will. Pedal to the metal. Um, one, two, three, four. Okay, we're at quorum, so we're going to keep going. Um, we're going to welcome uh, special services. Uh, I'm going to call to order work session 107. We are officially nine minutes behind. I'm going to try to keep us on schedule. We have till 1230. Um, I do want to uh, recognize we have Andy Whirlin, the school liaison commander for Fairfax City, who, who just walked out. I'm <laughs> going to acknowledge that Andy Whirlin just walked yeah. out the uh, door um, from Fairfax County Police Department, and Vicki Shope um, from our restorative justice program from FCPS at the front. Okay, so off we go. Yes, thank you. We asked them to join us today because if you recall, both in Caring Culture, the Caring, there he is, welcome. There you go. <laughs> okay. um, in both the review of the Caring Culture Report as well as uh, updates to the SRNR, we talked a little bit about the diversion program and trying our goal of keeping our students out of the court system and really utilizing restorative justice and some of our other practices to make that happen. And so there were a couple of comments about how we really are reducing the number of students who are involved in the court system and we thought we would put names with faces with their great work with the school system and see if you had any specific questions regarding diversion or regarding the court system and what we're doing with restorative justice. So we wanted them to be with us today. And um, so we open the floor in case you have any questions of Andy or Vicki. Okay, we're gonna do a mini presentation or we're gonna go right into Analyzing the then we have our other data that people have asked about before so I just didn't know if anybody had any specific questions I think Miss Strauss does okay Miss Strauss Right because this gets back to some of the questions that I had mm -hmm. so you have information from the court side Correct on how the diversion is going and the other question that I had had is it's my understanding that um, there has been a decline nationwide and within the county uh, with regard to um, teenage misbehavior um, that would normally um, send them to court and actually be in JDC. So Let, I guess my... my okay, Ms. Strauss, hold on a second. Let me just ask a question. Would it be easier to do questions and context at the end after you do a presentation? Because... What I want to do is that if Ms. Strauss had other questions or it's potential that questions that people are going to ask now may be answered during the course of the presentation. Okay. So mm -hmm. can you, would you mind parking lotting that question so that keeps us... Okay, you'll be first yeah. in line, don't worry. Yeah. You won't lose your place. Yeah, yeah. And basically, as you recall, um, a week ago Thursday night, we did the main presentation, but we had some follow-up questions where people wanted additional data from that Thursday night session, and so that's what these slides are. So we'll go ahead and do that, and then if anybody else has any questions, right. we if can you, answer those. Yeah, just do the slides first, and, okay. then, and then we'll have them in context. Great. Um, okay. Be great. All right, then we're going to start with Dana. There we go. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, I have a series of slides to present to you trying to get at a question that Mr. Moon asked at the last school board meeting regarding whether we are seeing fewer expulsions in Fairfax County Public Schools because students are committing fewer offenses that might result in an expulsion or whether we're seeing fewer expulsions primarily because we have um, changed the way we respond to the, those offenses. Before I get to that data, however, I did wanna show you this slide. It's a slide that was included in the annual report that you were issued and it gives you the 10 year view of referrals to the hearings office coming from the schools. And what this will show is that in the last 10 years, we've had fully a 50%
reduction in referrals to the hearings office, which is really outstanding. And it's a testament to all the hard work that's being done by the folks up here with prevention and intervention, and most certainly by the school folks, the administrators and the counselors and the psychologists and the teachers. So I didn't want to let this day pass without you seeing that. The rest of the slides you're going to see actually start with the 9-10 school year. So the changes don't look quite as dramatic, but when you pull it back four additional years, you get the, um, the big picture. Okay, to Mr. Moon's question, this was a graph that was provided to you in both the OPE report that was done about a month ago, and then again, Dr. Lip provided it to you at the last school board meeting. And essentially what this graph is showing is that in the last six years, we've had a 98% reduction in the number of students who have been expelled by Fairfax County Public Schools. As I explained to you that last Thursday, the bulk of that reduction is coming from the expulsion with services category. So when you look at this graph, the blue bars show what proportion of expulsions were expulsion with services. The red part of each bar shows the expulsion with no services. So 98% reduction overall and a 91% reduction in expulsions with services. Now, before I show you the other data, I wanted to point out that there are some limitations to this data in responding to Mr. Moon's question. First and foremost, when you look at hearings office data over the past six years, you're not necessarily comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. If you think of the SRNR, or one way to look at the SRNR, is it provides a bucket of offenses that must come to the hearings office. Over the past six years, that bucket has been shrinking. So when you look at the first bar on all of these graphs, which is the 0910 school year, you're starting with a larger bucket. You're starting with a bucket that includes not only all of the fences that must still come to the hearings office, but all of these additional offenses as well. As you move down the graph, that bucket has shrunk because these offenses over the years have stopped being mandatory referrals to the hearings office. That's not to say that they can't come to the hearings office. Some of them still do come to the hearings office, but they don't all come to the hearings office anymore. So that's one limitation of the data. Um, related to that is the idea, for example, if you look at possession of your own prescription medication at school. If you look at the 9-10 uh, school year, which is going to be the first bar, all of the students who brought their own prescription medication to school had to come through the hearings office. Beginning with the 11-12 school year, they no longer had to come to the hearings office. This data does not include the students who didn't come to the hearings office. So you do need to keep that in mind. This is only the students who came to the hearings office. To really get a sense of what's going on with prescrip prescription drugs in the school, we would have to combine the numbers on my graph with the numbers of students that were dealt with at the school level. That can be done. It's not impossible to do that. It's just it would have taken a lot longer um, than I could have done in the week that gets us here today. So this is going to show you a six-year perspective of the number of referrals to the hearings office compared to the number of expulsions. And what you'll see is that over the last six years, there's definitely been a downward trend, not only in expulsions, but also in referrals. Um, the expulsions have declined, as I said, by 98% over that time period. Referrals have declined by 30% over the same time period. So there is absolutely a reduction on both sides, the offenses that are coming to the hearings office as well as how we're responding to those offenses. Now, when you dig in and look at offenses category by category, the picture is a bit more mixed. So the next series of slides will do that. This is the six-year perspective on weapons offenses coming to the hearings office. 
Again, you know, the overall trend is down. It's certainly not down in any linear way. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. But over the last six, six years, there's been a slight decrease in weapons offenses coming to the hearings office, keeping in mind, of course, that there have been categories of offenses that no longer must come to the hearings office, and those are printed below for you. Um, this is also showing that there's been a significant increase or decrease, excuse me, in the number of students expelled for a weapons violation. And in fact, last school year, no students were expelled from Fairfax County as the result of a weapons violation. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't receive consequences. They received appropriate consequences, everyone, if there was a sense that they presented a risk to other students or to staff members, then they were reassigned to one of our alternative programs where would, they would have the appropriate level of supervision. So I don't want to give the impression that they didn't receive consequences, they just weren't expelled. This is showing you all of the drug distribution cases that have been received over the past six years. This is as, about as close to an apples to apples comparison as you're gonna get because what was a mandatory referral to the hearings office six years ago is still a mandatory referral to the hearings office. There have not been categories of offenses that have come out of this bucket. And what we're seeing is that over the last six years, these numbers are pretty flat. Again, they go up and down a little bit over time, but we haven't seen a big increase in the number of distribution offenses, but unfortunately, nor have we seen a large decrease. If you keep in mind, however, that that line is remaining pretty flat at the same time that the overall student population is growing, I think that is a positive. And I should point out as well, because I think this is important, when you go back to the 9, 10, and the 10, 10, 11 school years in Fairfax County, then if you distributed drugs at school, chances are you were going to be expelled by the school board. The majority of those students were expelled. Of course, the vast majority expelled with services. That began to change um, in 11, 12. And then last school year, we had no students expelled as a result of a drug distribution offense. And again, I want to emphasize that doesn't mean that they didn't receive an appropriate consequence. They did, they just weren't expelled. These are your other drug offenses, which would essentially be any drug offense that came to the hearings office that was not a marijuana or controlled substance abuse offense. So this is going to be your drug possession, your drug use. In the first three years, there were some alcohol distribution offenses included in there as well that um, dropped out of the bucket back in the 13-14 school year. So other than those few alcohol distribution offenses, this would be primarily prescription drugs and marijuana. Definitely the overall trend is downward and no students have been expelled for a drug possession or use offense since the 12-13 school year. These are your serious assaults and threats. Of course, the hearings office does not get every assault or every threat, but we do get the ones that the principals believe are very serious. Um, again, this, this is very similar to the weapons data in the sense that the progress has not been linear. It's up and it's down. Um, and overall, it's kind of flat in the last six years. If you draw a line from 9-10 to 14-15, Certainly, there has been a significant decrease in the number of students expelled for having engaged in these aggressive behaviors. Last year, two students were expelled. One of the two was a result of an assault, which is represented by the very, very thin red bar on the 14-15 school year. Dana, are some of these crimes in the community? No. Not yet? Okay. These are the crimes in the community actually. So all everything outside of this graph, it's all school-based behavior. This graph is showing you the criminal convictions that could result in an expulsion. Those numbers have always been very low. 
primarily actually because we tend to deal with those criminal community-based offenses when we see them as charges. Once they've been convicted, the principals have the option to bring them back to the hearings office to look as, at an expulsion, but traditionally the principals don't do that unless the student presents such a risk to others that, that perhaps we need to look at a no, uh, at a no services option. But essentially, I wanted to show you this data because while it's very small in terms of total number of referrals to our office, it's, it's a relatively large um, percentage of the actual expulsions that come down are for these community-based crimes. And that's just a testament to the fact that these students um, who have committed such aggressive and violent crimes in the community um, do present a risk to our other students regardless of what that setting is. So you do see a larger number of expulsions associated with these. And in fact, last school year, the other um, expulsion that we had represented, you can almost not see it, by the thin green line on the um, last bar was an expulsion for no services as a result of a crime that occurred in the community. These are your other offenses. So this is everything that isn't drugs, weapons, assaults, threats, and crimes in the community. Essentially, this is gonna be your gang activity. Um, it's gonna be bullying, uh, harassment, disrespect, defiance, theft, um, everything else. And here is where you really do see a sustained improvement. We're getting far fewer referrals than we used to get. Again, I think this is testament to the hard work that's going on in the schools and the capacity that's been built with the SOSA program and the RJ program to handle a lot of these other offenses at the school level instead of sending them on to the hearings office. Again, in a further attempt to address Mr. Moon's question, um, we looked at the number of things that were reported to the Virginia Department of Education. Um, they require, uh, <laughs> we have green sheets and yellow sheets, but basically um, there are certain things, the, the most um, weapons and assaults and things like that must be reported regardless of consequence. Then there's a list of other behaviors that are only reported if it results in a suspension. So um, again, back to the question of are we seeing more of these behaviors uh, over the course of time, we're definitely seeing a decline in the number of incidents that have to be reported to the Virginia Department of Education and again, within a context of increased population. So um, it was just a quick snapshot way of looking at it. That, that go back to that slide if you don't mean for a moment, that's significant because their standard has never changed. Right. Although we're kind of moving the needle and trying to improve our practices, their standards have never changed. Right. And going from a high of 9,510 to 7,195 is a significant change, all while we've grown significantly during that same period of time. So that's right. very significant. Mr. Schultz, could I ask the, a quick clarification question? Otherwise, you can remove me from the. If, thank you. Very quick. My very quick question on the... If we run late, I'm blaming you. Okay, thank you. I'll be blamed. So, you know, all your, you showed the a, a offenses that's been removed from mandatory reporting to the, you know, hearings offices. Are they still being reported under this to video all of those? Yes. Okay, so thank you. The, whatever the criteria was in 2000, 10, 11 is still the same criteria yeah, for the because, because that's what I just education. heard from superintendents. Right, yes. So the ones that the school had dealt with on their own, um, if they resulted in a suspension but not the referral to the hearings office, they would still be in here. Or if they were just under yeah, the that was that was what I ones. needed to hear. I mean, it's yep. it's a you know seeing the numbers going down is you know give me a lot of comfort. Okay, great. The other piece is that we tried to look at CIS overall, and again, we've changed categories and definitions, but if you look overall in the last two years, we've had a 15% decline in total uh, entries into CIS, and that's fairly consistent then if you're looking at how many people are putting into the system 
anything that they deem appropriate to document and record. So there is that 15% reduction in that also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now you can remove my name from your list. You were quick. Then we go to Ms. Schultz's question about talking specifically uh, about middle school students with disabilities and um, referrals that we have for that and what specifically as a system we're doing to address appropriate behavior, appropriate strategies. So as with many things, we've got several aspects that we're looking at this from uh, several different views of the lens. Um, this last year we updated uh, for secondary students our strategies for success and have implemented a lot of additional um, curriculum, review, strategies, things that students can do to help them in terms of their own problem solving and decision making. We're also reminded that many of our students with disabilities are on a continuum. We've got more involved students. These would be your Cat B students who have um, significant autism, uh, emotional disabilities, um, your intellectual disabilities, and that personal development class, depending on where they're coming to you from and where they're entering on the continuum. Again, we really work a lot on that in terms of behaviors. We've also done a lot of extensive training. The schools are asking us for additional behavioral support and training to help students specifically. So this is kind of a summary of the different types of trainings that we're offering. And especially on our strategic planning days, staffs are asking for a part of the day in the schools with their principal and then part of the day for central training on the more involved um, behavioral support. Our PBI S programs in terms of what working with students across all schools and again you can talk about students with or without disabilities we really are looking at system-wide programs to offer expectations consistency routine and support as well as coming up with strategies on um, how to come up with positive strategies and positive um, expectations and work within schools um, uh, we also highlighted the extensive cultural responsive implementation that's coming as well as schools that have already done some work in this area. And then the final piece of that is for some of our more severe students, we have implemented um, uh, surveys and um, functional behavioral assessments and behavioral intervention plans specifically for those students. So I'm gonna let... Um, Just real quickly, um, I looked over a three-year view of how many have been done for students with disabilities, and it's running between 600 and 650 without a really significant uptick, and we have been doing some extra training hoping that people would utilize them more, again, as a prevention or or a proactive strategy. So there has been a group working this school year on developing a more streamlined approach to the functional behavioral assessment to make it a little bit more user friendly. And um, there's training expected on that in the fall. So again, for those really involved students between the FBAs and the BIPs, you can get at some very specific behavioral intervention plans. So we also wanted to highlight that. And then again, it depends on where the student's coming to us on the continuum and where they enter. But a lot of our IEP teams, especially our psychologists, our social workers, the local screening committees, um, our behavioral intervention teachers are part of that planning team to be able to both look at the data from the functional behavioral assessment as well as help develop the behavioral intervention plan. Yeah. So those were the specific questions that we had from Thursday night. No. <laughs> but um, right. some of the data we wanted to provide. So um, we, of course, wanted to answer any additional questions people had. I have um, Ms. Strauss as promised, and then Ms. McLaughlin, and I don't have anybody else other than myself on the list. Oh, Mr. Moon, you're back on the list? Okay. Okay. Um, you said you were finished. Mm -hmm. I remember. That's on record. Okay. Um, sort of uh, big picture questions. Um, uh, from the data that I have seen, and I do want to get to the diversion program, I am assuming that 
sort of major criminal activities like heroin, crack, pills, meth, that's not occurring in our schools. Whatever we read in the newspaper, it's in the community, it's older, but we're not seeing it coming to school. In other words, that level of, of um, distribution or use is, is not on school grounds. So that's I'm hoping the answer is yes, that whatever's going on is in. We're seeing very little of that. That's any, what I wanted to Any yeah. um, offense of that nature would have to come to the hearings exactly. office so that I would know about that. Right. Um, it's been several years since right. we've received a. That's uh, my understanding. Uh, a case of heroin, for example. Right, we do great. occasionally see some serious drugs, but it's a rarity. That's right. So whatever when, that involvement, it's... When it's I say serious, I mean the Schedule 1s. I don't want right, to exactly. you know, imply that our Schedule 2 drugs aren't serious, but your, as you said, the, the crack cocaine, the right. heroin. Yeah. Um, last year, we had an uptick in LSD, Right. cases which are a schedule one drug right. um, but this year we're not seeing that so for some reason last year appeared to be an outlier yeah. if I might add to that in, in light of what we've heard from the county and the drug use that they're seeing in the across the county and it's not unique to Fairfax I think we're seeing it across the country the fact that we've been able to keep it out of our schools right. to the extent we have I think is, is an important right point. and that's my question which is which is wonderful and our officer you were going to comment on that because you know what goes on on the street as well as in the schools. I like to pretend I do, yes. No, <laughs> out, 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 what you see on the news, what you see in the papers, generally what is going on out in the community. And, and oftentimes it's not the youth that are in the schools, but those just beyond that age. And right. you know, the heroin overdoses, they, they happen all the time, frankly. And they're usually older folks, you know, and I mean older by 20s and 30s and even right. 40s and 50s. They're, they're all ranges. But fortunately, yes, we don't, we don't really see. And I see pretty much anything that comes across the radar that's serious. I see everything. Fairly, you know, good. good stuff. Right. That's yes. a good thing. Yeah, it is good. You know? That's a good thing. Then my next question also is gang activity jumping in. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't see as much in school as we did years ago. So that, again, is my question. Yeah, let's um, start. I would say that if you look to 10 or 12 years ago, okay we are in a much, much better place exactly. than we were 10 or 12 years ago. It's not even comparable. That's not to say that we, we don't have serious gang activity in the schools. We do see it. Um, it tends to tick up and tick down. We tend to have flare-ups in a certain part of the county, and then that seems to come under control, and then it will flare up in another part of the county. But certainly we're not seeing the kind of numbers we were seeing 10 years ago. And I'm sorry, sex trafficking, whatever that's in the community, it's not in our schools because we work very, very hard to keep those contacts out of school. Absolutely, and Great. a lot of that's intelligence driven anyway. Exactly. So we, we try to keep it out of the schools as much as we can, and you know, and I think sometimes, I, anecdotally, but the message is, you know, if they're going to do that stuff, they keep it out of the schools. They do it on their own time. You know, they that's don't. Right. They don't. They don't do it in the But school. we try very hard to keep people Absol out of that. So Absolutely. that was all right. Yeah. So yeah. you are seeing all right. Those. That's good news. We do work very hard on that. However, if um, the authorities come to school and notify us of those situations. We, of course, try to work with the families, right. offer I them know. resources. and right. Our um, schools and our principals work very, very hard on that. They them. do. They right. do, and have really helped a lot of students and families, especially in the last couple of years. Okay, We do Great. have one person assigned to that specifically. Right. So that's his expertise, so mm -hmm. right. always available. Right. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. I have um, Ms. McLaughlin, uh, Mr. Moon, and then uh, Ms. Darren at Kofax. Thank you. Um, I do want to echo everyone's, uh, you know, real uh, in sense of encouragement, Dr. Garza, that we're looking at um, the continued improvement in the way we approach discipline in our schools. And I want to thank everyone. Um, staff who's here today to help speak to it. I think it really speaks well of Fairfax County. Um, but as my colleagues know, um, there seems to strangely be an area where we just aren't making the progress where we need to. Uh, and it's in an area that is well supported by educational best practice and research. And so I wanted to 
um, have the conversation with you all today and invite Dr. Lip um, to also uh, speak to it uh, because both she and I reached out to Arlington County Public Schools. And as some of you know, I've been talking about our Second Chance program, which is for students who are caught for a first time offense um, with marijuana um, possession, as well as in where my concern rests, which, which is use. And uh, so I'm gonna share with you my conversation with Assistant Superintendent in Arlington Public Schools, Cynthia Johnson, and then again, invite Dr. Lip to add what she knows from her conversation. But Cynthia Johnson is an 18-year veteran principal um, in Arlington Public Schools before she took over um, Assistant Superintendent um, of their administrative um, programs and services. And she did clarify that yes, in fact, use is embedded within possession with their second chance program. So if you're caught having used marijuana for the first time, um, it is the same and is treated the same and the access to their diversion program um, is the same, whether it was that you possessed at school or that you were caught having used it at school. Uh, the, she believes it's an outstanding program um, that within the last three years, their data analysis demonstrated that 88% of the students, whether it's possession and or use, do not repeat offend. So what you, you can see is that nine out of 10, they don't commit that, that um, future alcohol or drug infraction. Um, she said, we are in the business of helping kids be successful. This includes helping kids learn from their actions and make better decisions. As a diversion program, it enables students to become better educated and more aware of the perils of drug use. The purpose of this program is to help. Its intent is to help. It provides support to our families to get the outcomes that we seek, which is to reduce alcohol and drug use in our schools. So I, I really want to highlight this again because uh, when I spoke to Dr. Lip to try and understand why our school system has been so reluctant to um, follow the model of Arlington to have both possession and use um, for first-time offense be incorporated with our second chance program review. Um, the only information um, that I have been given is that it, our principals are uncomfortable, um, including use in this diversion um, access and opportunity. And if there's additional information for why not, I would like to understand, but I also think it's really important that we have the conversation about what the research says, what the best practice says, the fact that Arlington continues to be successful with this, the fact that if you look on, um, I believe it's slide three of the staff responses, fewer mandatory referrals, um, I, I gotta tell you, it, it begs the question that under the influence of drugs, two times within 12 months, and that's still not a mandatory referral. So mob assault, not a mandatory referral. Possession of weapons like throwing stars, and I've actually seen one of those. Those things are extremely sharp and dangerous. Um, I, I really hope that we as a board, um, and, I, and again, I reached out to Dr. Lip because I want to be able to partner with Dr. Garza's leadership on this. I want to very much understand what is holding us back? And Ms. Evans can speak to this more than anyone around this board table. Parent notification was an uncomfortable thing for our principals. That was not something that they you know, really felt comfortable around. So I respect our principals not being comfortable with including use um, for a first time offense, but this isn't about what's comfortable or uncomfortable, it's about best practice. And when you've got an 18 year principal out of Arlington, who's now leading this program and believes in it and believes this is the right thing to do, it follows criminal law. There's no distinction of possession use in criminal law. It's you possess it or you distribute it. And we, we treat distribution of alcohol and inhalants more leniently in terms of the mandatory referral than we do for a, a student who, is, who has used for the first time. So I would really hope that- Okay, Ms. McLaughlin, I need you to get, we're, we're trying to get back on 
and we're running out of time. So I, I got yes, a lot of people in mind. That's fine. So okay. I would like to invite Ms. Uh, Dr. Lip to add anything to what my conversation had been with um, Arlington's um, assistant superintendent. Um, I think you summarized the data correctly. Um, we were looking at talk, speaking with them and about their program. Um, and what you've summarized is what they had to say in terms of their four-year program. And I would also add to that, if I may, um, our, our principals, I have to get, I give our principals a lot of credit. And I look at people at the end of the table, because all of you as well worked with the principal committee we put together that first year I was here. And we really spent almost a year developing the recommendations that we brought to you all. Um, and I think we're, I think we've, you know, I think obviously the changes that were made are making a significant difference. This is a success story, um, what we're talking about today. Um, I will tell you that when we, we had some pretty lively discussions around the difference between uh, possession and use. So I wanna, I wanna just describe their perspective on how they see that, okay? And they're, they're the people we hold responsible for keeping our schools safe. And I you know, respect what Arlington is doing. We certainly have studied school systems all across the country on this issue and other, other places as well. I mean, we wanna learn from other people. But the way we see it, and I actually agree with our principals on this, there's clearly a difference between having something in your pocket or in your backpack versus going into the restroom and, and using it on school premises. And that's the distinction um, that our principals made. And that is, um, it, it, it's, it's more overt, more blatant if you're gonna actually use it on premises. And um, so they were concerned about students being able to smell marijuana in the schools. You know, we want to prevent that uh, where we can. So, I mean, I respect what Ms. McLaughlin is trying to accomplish here. I think it's certainly worthy of a conversation for the board to have. But I do want to add to the perspective of our school-based uh, administrators and why those many conversations that we had, that's the viewpoint uh, I think we also have to appreciate Okay. Uh, as well. All right. And if I can just clarify, the students who use marijuana do come to the um, three-day seminar. They are not excluded from the three-day seminar. That That's not the point, Dr. Panarelli. The point is that they are required to have to go to the hearings office, and they are at risk of being involuntarily transferred. If you were in Arlington, you would have the same access, whether it's possession or use, and it is certainly been successful and it certainly is less traumatizing to I the think, students. I think the point is, is that the Arlington program has an 88% non-recidivism rate, and and it's both for possession and use. We got that, Ms. McLaughlin. Okay, I need to move along. Um, I have uh, Mr. Moon, then Ms. Corbett Sanders, then Ms. Evans, then Mr. Wilson, then Ms. Hines, then me. So, uh, no. No, after, after Mr. Moon is Ms. Darnett Koufax. I think I sent in this question to uh, Dr. Lip. <laughs> Sorry that it wasn't until yesterday, yesterday uh, regarding what's on page 16 of SRNR. It has to do with the property violations. It's a B1. When you look at um, what's on the bold dock, that's a page 21. Um, there, you're, not, you're not recommending any changes, but just thought the question occurred to me about this particular provision about theft of another person's property or money by the use of force or fear. Normally, I consider that to be a robbery in, in common law sense, is a using force or fear to take somebody's property or money. Mm -hmm. And principal could treat that as lenient as not doing anything, is that? You're is right that that is a robbery. Um, and it has never been, robbery has never been a mandatory referral to the division superintendent, primarily because when you think of a, a K-12 school con context, what that could look like in an elementary school is very different from what it could look like in a high school. So if you have a second grade student bullying another second grade student and taking his snack, that would be a robbery. 
if you have a high school student who assaults another student and steals the watch off of his wrist, that's a robbery. So what the document does is it gives that high school principal the discretion to say, this is beyond the pale. This is coming to the hearings office. I have the discretion to do that while also giving- So as a, a, a board member, as a board member, I don't really, in practic practical sense, have to worry about high school or middle school principals condoning or not doing anything in, in a situation where a bully using the force, taking somebody's calculator or cell phone away from another, another student and well, it is it is a discretionary consequence, but you know if we trust our principals to look at these individually and say, you know, this was really bad. I'm going to recommend that, that you be transferred to an alternative setting. You need more supervision, as opposed to a principal looking at it and saying, maybe this warrants a five day suspension or a one day suspension or an RJ, or and and we're trusting our principals to make those decisions. Um, and it's this is a category offense that has always been at the discretion so if the of the victim principals. or victim's family disagrees with us with the principal's disposition of the case, handling of the case, they could report that to police and if a police files a charge, there would be different consequences for the Well, the, the parent could pursue robbery charges for sure. Um, I think that if a parent were pursuing robbery charges, first of all, the principal knows that up front because of the relationship with the SRO. I would be shocked if, well, I would be shocked if we had a principal with a situation where a child was robbed at school, the parents are pursuing robbery charges, and the student didn't come to the hearings office. The principal wouldn't have to, but I would be surprised if the student didn't come. I would also say this is a very, at least the serious cases, it, it also is a very rare offense. We might see maybe two to three robberies a year that come to the hearings office. If it was serious, I'm very confident the principals would call and and seek guidance. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Ms. Darnat Koufax, then Ms. Karen Corbett-Sanders, then Ms. Evans. Well, I thank you all for this, you know, mostly good news report. It, I mean, some of the amazing changes we've seen in referrals to the hearing office, as well as the 98% reduction in expulsion, it's such good news, and it's, it's a whole system-wide change, and I really, really do appreciate that. So thank you all who've, who've worked hard to, to help our students um, you know, help themselves in a way to be more successful and learn from their mistakes, so thank you. Um, Commander Wehrlin, the one question I have for you is when you do see gang activity in an uptick, how exactly does your, do, do the police work with our schools to ensure that the community feels safe, to ensure that the community is informed and also to, you know, um, nip it in the bud? First of all, it's always Andy, please. Okay. Um, the, um, for example, West, West Potomac recent, was the most recent easy example to point out. Not long after that occurred, uh, Sean Martin, the captain down there, had a, had a big meeting. It was bus related, so we had people from uh, transportation. Uh, Mr. Stork, who's now the supervisor down there, shit, was there. Us, we were there. Gang unit was there. And it was a lot of, and um, principal of West Potomac, what's his name? Alex. Yes. Alex, yeah, the case was there. So everything comes together. We talk about what the problem was, what, what the gang has kind of inferred from what they've talked to. The kids talk. These gang kids, they talk. They let, they, they're proud of what they do, some of them. So they talk. So there's lots of good information to be gathered and given. And then, you know, we take that to the school, to Mr. Stork, and then through all those different means, the information gets out that, yeah, we're on it. There's a presence, a police presence that's increased noticeably, quite noticeably in this case. Um, a plan is developed to keep an eye on the buses. What, what could we do in the future? Um, I don't think our public information almost puts out much on it in terms of, I think they did that night perhaps, but it, it kind of flares down. But the information is more, I don't want to say grassroots, but it's through the school community, through the kit messages and that kind of thing. The police are on it, we're working it, we've got arrests, and I believe that resulted in 12 arrests. Um, where that's gonna go, I don't know. But still, that sends a message. We're on it, and we're on it quick. And that's how we clamp down on it. We don't waste time trying to figure out really 
what happened. We try to figure out how to stop it from happening again quickly, and then we get to the root of it through that. And, and that's what we did in this case. And that's a great example of, of, of how we do it. When it happens, and fortunately, those types of flare-ups, I think this year, that might have been the first real significant incident. So yeah, it's, that's, what, you know, that's what we do. Well, thank you for highlighting that. The, the one thing that I, um, well, I, I found missing in that, though, was when you reach out to the Board of Supervisors, and we can talk about this offline perhaps, but it's also important that you reach out to our board um, because we're not always aware of that. And sometimes when we get the messaging from the principals, that's fine, but what if we get it from the community? And it makes it, it makes for I, an uncomfortable. I agree with you 100%. And having, at one time, not too long ago, I had one of the worst jobs in the world, and that was a director, of the, I was the acting director of our public information office. And, and Dr. Garza may know because everything comes at you all day, all the time, right, and I'm right. like the and gatekeeper, I, so I know. And I've had my own struggles with that office in particular, not getting stuff to me, through me, and to John, and to Matt upstairs so that you all get it. It kind of frustrates me, and I have no bones about telling you that, but there's some miscommunications that happen, some disconnects. I, you know, I apologize for it, but I'm trying, I've been trying hard to make that better Okay. Because I've tried to pretty much say, and this is just not gang stuff, I'll tell you all now, that if it involves the schools in any way, shape, or form, I need to at least know about it so that I can let John and Matt know about it so that in turn, everybody here can know about it just to have an awareness of it because there ain't nothing you can do about it, but at least you know it's going on and we're on it and, and there's stuff happening. So, yeah, that's not lost on me. Yeah, it, <laughs> be, well, and, and because, and, and as I said, that, that particular instance was, was one where there, that communication broke down, but I, I appreciate the hard work that you do. I also, in another life, um, worked in communications, and I, I know being that point person to fan out the information and get it out is is a, is a difficult one, but you know I I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll work through that and, and I think so. We're having a new director. There's a whole change up there. Okay. The whole office is really completely changed uh, and will be changed. A new director hopefully be announced in the next couple of weeks. I'm hoping. Wonderful. And her, her that person's number two is is new, and so I think a lot of change. And and I'll and I'll meet with them anyway. Um, uh, John and I and Matt will meet, try to right. get a meeting. Right. So we'll, we'll try to make it. We work. appreciate that, and we appreciate your work with our schools. Thank I, you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. So, I will echo <laughs> what Ms. Derenak Kofax uh, has just said on a couple of points. One, we are very appreciative of all the hard work and the progress that has been made. Um, but the concerns over the gang situation and the reporting um, was a failure. Um, because I would suggest that at the same time that um, communication with the supervisors, we should have, the two school board members who represent those students directly and represent that school should have at least had a heads up. I was actually um, heard about it from about four other people before I heard about it from anybody else. And those As were opposed all, to a failure, I think you, what you meant was c could have been done better. <laughs> Yes, okay. okay, could have been done better. I'm just, I'm just making sure I understood. Yes, yes, you've got it. I apologize for my um, deliberate language. Um, but I also have a couple of questions uh, that are related to that, which, uh, first, how did we decide to take some of this stuff off of the mandatory referral list? because I'm a little stunned that some of these things are pretty aggressive and why are they off the list, um, such as mob assault, um, none, you know, some of the weapons, that they are not mandatory. That, that's a bit disconcerting to me. Um, that's probably a more detailed question than we can do right here, Ms. Corbett Sanders, because that goes back for historical okay. time. I just am I mean, out of curiosity because these are pretty big things to come off a list. I, I'm happy to answer it. It won't take me very long at all. Um, I can roll right down for you. Possession of razor blades, that was actually a court decision. Um, back at the time of this court decision, um, the statutory weapons law in the Code of Virginia included razors and the the uh, Supreme Court of Virginia decided that a razor blade was not a razor as defined in criminal code. So that came off because of a court decision, position, possession of your own prescription medication with no intent to distribute or misuse, um, school board decision. 
Um, mob assault, that was also a school board decision, and that's again because I think if you look at a K-12 context and what a mob assault, um, and, and I don't in any way want to suggest that mob assaults aren't serious, but what they can look at, look like when it's sixth and seventh graders compared to what they can look like when it's high school students or if it's two in the mob compared to five in the mob. It just gives the principals the discretion to handle it in the way that they think it is appropriate. We certainly still get mob assaults. Do we get every single one? I'm sure that we don't. Do we get the serious ones? I'm confident that we do. Okay. Um, and then along, just a little couple more um, questions. One is regarding the, uh, the gang activity. Um, I know that, and you all immediately triaged, um, and there was some progress there. But I'm actually more concerned about what we are doing in the aftermath to reach out to um, the affected communities in educating parents and people in the community as a grassroots effort to be alert, be aware, what do we need to do to, um, to change these patterns? And so I would urge that we have a broader community, a broader discussion about that, probably not today because I'm cognizant of Mrs. Schultz's time. Um, and then another area where you can certainly come back to me, if you like, is on the linkage. I, I'm wondering if there's a linkage of the results of our student surveys in some areas, in particular drug and alcohol use, and that if we see an outlier on those surveys where a particular school may have a higher representation of use of drugs or alcohol in the past 30 days, um, do we do something as a, um, from your offices to try to help those schools? Yes, that data is shared with the principals, it's shared with the student leadership, and together we plan a variety of prevention activities at targeted schools for targeted. And so what's that threshold for the intervention? Uh, we usually are just looking at um, higher than the county average rates. Okay. But I would also say that we've done a lot more work in the past two years, especially across pyramids. P schools used to look at their data individually, and now we're really looking at it more high school, middle school, elementary, the whole period. Yeah. That's Correct. so important because Correct. if we can, through education early on, ideally we avoid mm -hmm. the challenges as we go further up. Mm -hmm. one Thank you. One last thing I want to say is I want to give a shout out also to facilities and to our safety and security offices. Um, having been a building administrator, if you come back to school on Monday morning and see any type of graffiti or anything else, immediately it's removed from your facility. And that's really great work by our, our departments to make sure our buildings are clean and safe and positive. So I do, since I saw Tom in the back, I wanted to mention that. <laughs> he will. Okay, Ms. Evans. Thank you. I, I, I think that uh, one thing that comes through loud and clear is just how far we have come on student discipline in uh, the last five or six years. So congratulations to everybody who did all the hard work uh, that was required to get us to, to where we are now. Um, I wanted to thank Ms. McLaughlin for raising the Second Chance Program and the issue of use. It's... Um, you know we've had we have discussions on this we we have discussions and personally i don't know how i'm going to come out on this one yet um i need to, to be thoughtful about it but i do think that there's a lack of clarity now in the srnr and i think we do need to to be clear on um the issue of use and uh, whether use is treated the same way possession is or if use is tr treated the same way uh, the distribution is. So I do think that we need to, to have that discussion. Um, I, I do feel strongly we need to, we, we really need to be working on reducing marijuana use. We, we have to do that. Right now more students, according to the Youth Risk Survey, smoke marijuana than smoke tobacco. You know, we've made huge inroads on tobacco use. That's great. You know, we need to make more inroads into marijuana use. So um, I, you know, if there's a, an amendment coming, I, I hope we'll see it, uh, the language of it soon. And 
I would welcome any uh, particular research on this that would, would help inform the board. So thank you for raising it. I do think we need clarity on that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Evans, uh, Mr. Wilson, and then Ms. Hines. Yeah, thank you, um, and uh, I echo some of the folks that have commented uh, on the the numbers that appear to show us, Dr. Garza said, a, a huge success story. My questions are really um, fairly straightforward. Uh, this, this past year, we've heard uh, on a number of occasions that there have been schools closed because of bomb threats. And I was wondering, how have you seen that statistic change in the last few years? And does that get reflected in any of this data? Yeah, I don't actually have numbers on the bomb threats. Okay. I, I can, I'm sure I could find them. Uh, I think historically they're probably similar year to year. Now, in terms of the evacuations, that's always the principal's decision. Mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, we, we vet them as quickly as we can, as we can, as soon as we can. Unfortunately, they're generally nonsense. It's just somebody usually overseas having fun and in their minds. It's fun to do this to, to cause us to react. Uh, in terms of numbers, though, I couldn't give you that. Okay. I will tell you, Mr. Wilson, they do tend to be groupings of them, sadly. Um, we'll go months and months and months, you know, never have a bomb threat, and then you'll have one, and for some reason it, it, it triggers copycats, um, or sometimes I feel like there's just one individual that has, has made it a, a point to to disrupt our schools we were quiet we had a book like two or three weeks just it just went crazy and that's yeah. exactly yes sir so i think they do tend to either uptick or or downtick it's, it's more of a, a school safety issue than really a discipline uh question that you're that you've talked about i just did, i didn't i think that in the community some folks hear that and they they don't assume that it's just you know a copycat or a kid you know in somewhere else you know deciding they're going to prank uh, the Fairfax County Public Schools, and it's good to hear that that's what you're finding, that when you look into them, you're not finding that actually somebody had intent. No. We've, we've never had a situation since I've been here that any of them were legitimate, um, you know, legitimate um, threats. Legitimate threat. yeah. yeah, with credibility. No, so yeah, that. none of them were credible threats. And we try real hard, Mr. Wilson, because I think this is an important question, to make sure our parents get information right away through our kit system. Uh, so they know that we're, you know, evaluating, we're taking them seriously, but we, you know, what our findings were. Okay. And then, uh, then these are also uh, questions maybe best answered by the officer. Um, do you believe that, that over the last five years that, that students, uh, fewer students are engaging in inappropriate or illegal uh, behavior? Hard question for you to answer because that, that would five years, hundreds of thousands of students over the course of five years. From what I've seen, and my kids are in the schools in the Region 5, um, I think it's probably gotten better overall, at least in my one year here. Right. I haven't seen anything. It was always something that makes you shake your head, but I haven't seen anything that's on it, anywhere, obviously. But I haven't seen anything horrifying. I haven't heard anything from any of the people sitting with me where, where there's an steady de um, increase in anything as, as, as the numbers bear out. It seems to be a, a decline. Anecdotally, I couldn't, you know, I, I know certain districts more than others, so I wouldn't be able to tell you specifically. Yeah, so along those same lines, I mean, do we, do we believe that drug use is declining amongst the high school students? Do we I, I, believe yeah. that gang participation is, at, is declining in actual numbers? Um, uh, these are the kind of questions that I have when I hear this. It's, it, I mean, I think that the what we're doing in terms of the discipline process makes a lot of sense to me, but I would like to see sort of is there an efficacy in terms of, you know, ultimately when we're graduating kids into the community, are we doing better at, at, at having kids that are uh, – have a less incidence of drug use, you know, as they enter into the The only workforce. thing we have that sort of gives us an insight into that um, is the youth survey. And on the youth survey, we certainly have seen increasing use of marijuana. Um, gang activity has been always low and continues to be very low, pretty constant um, in terms of what the kids are reporting themselves. Um, you know, I think it's, it's marijuana is the biggest uptick. I don't know about drug use in general, but marijuana has definitely been an uptick. And I think, again, you have surrounding jurisdictions that are legalizing. There's a lot of conversation going on. You have 
kids whose parents are not necessarily, what we see is if the parents are saying, no, you shouldn't do this, kids are very unlikely to do it. If the kids are not saying that they are hearing from their parents that it's a, something that they're gonna take a stand on, then it has an impact. Yeah, and I, and I guess because again, anecdotally, if you if you're just sort of reading the newspapers, you know, there, there's a constant drumbeat of the discussion about the epidemic of opioid use in yeah. the community, and and you know, development of of uh, marijuana related drugs with higher THC concentrations, and and I mean that the damage that you know uh, of a child that gets addicted to a, a drug has on their family and their life is just so dramatic so that, that that i would love to be able to say definitively that you know we are getting at that problem at the core level um, in terms of making a, a dent in terms of the amount of usage by children I was at the um, town hall the other day on the opi opioids and have um, connected with a couple additional organizations that we may be able to weave into our prevention activities. I mean, I think that the kids, again, even with marijuana, I think that that they've learned not to do it at school. <laughs> Beyond the windows of school, it's, I, it's increasing as far as we can tell. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. I have uh, Ms. Hines and Mr. Pross. Thank you very much. Um, my, my point is actually about the um, Second Chance Program for use at school, and I also want to thank Ms. McLaughlin for bringing that. I hope uh, bringing it to the board, um, at, because I, I do th I, what I hear staff saying is that you, you, are n you need that direction from the board to change to a different way of approaching it, right? We don't, uh, right now, we treat possession as, uh, no, use at school. Um, as different from possession at school. And yeah, and I, I, I get that. And um, I, so I would say that um, I, I also think they're different. And one of the things I also, I'm not sure where I stand on it, um, but I, one of the things that I want to be careful about, and I know that Ms. McLaughlin did not intend this, but I don't think of it as a question of making our principals comfortable. That's the only word that kind of worried me a little bit. I don't think it's that they're uncomfortable because honestly, I think being a high school principal is probably uncomfortable 24 seven, right? <laughs> Um, but I think um, it's more, you know, they are on the front line trying to balance what's best for this one student um, and what's best for the community of the school itself. And that is what this bigger community expects of us as well. So, um, so I, I, uh, I, I take the desire seriously, but I look at it more uh, as that from that lens, I guess. Mr. Press. Thank you. Um, I want to commend staff on, you know, once again, outlining, um, you know, some of the challenges we faced in, in discipline uh, issues. I think something that was interesting to me, you know, being in the system for 12 years, what I've seen grow uh, in my experience has been the awareness and outlining of expectations around discipline uh, and defenses in school. Um, I can say that, for example, um, outlining the expectations about what constitutes a mob assault and how that will be disciplined and informing students about that could be a big contributor. And I, I, you know, in my, my hypothesis would be that is that it is a contributor to why we might have seen a reduction. So my point in saying that is by outlining expectations and letting students know what the potential consequences could be and what is an offense on school grounds, um, we can contribute to a decline uh, in those offenses. I think that these resources, uh, you know, the, the handbook, I know that a lot of students do actually go home and, and read these. Um, I, you know, having these two pagers for the, for the younger kids, uh, I think holds a lot of benefit. I know the videos that staff produces to show students what, you know, some of the more common uh, themes are in, in uh, you know, in discipline and how we can, how we address those and, and you know, wh what the awareness is there is really effective. So uh, my first question to you is, how are we maintaining and improving that program as we see a changing climate in our school as to what the offenses might be? An example that I know Ms. Schultz and I speak frequently about is the opioid use. Um, how are we, you know, in the face of that new challenge, outlining expectations around what that might, you know, how we can build awareness in our schools? We're working right now on the script for the new video <laughs> um, and haven't finalized it. So that is certainly something that we could add. The, the 
the reason I wanted to bring the booklet itself and the two things that we give to kids is because there have been some questions about um, tone and, and different things, and I wanted to clarify that the SR&R itself is a legal document with a lot of legal ang language in it, but the, what the parents receive has a lot of introductory um, information. So, you know, around the opioid use, I think that we are definitely planning to put more information in, in our prevention programming around that, but we can certainly look at the materials that you have and see whether there's something that could be added to the older kids program. Yeah, you know, I guess my comment on that would be is just never under, underestimate the power of awareness if a student knows that it's going to be something that is not allowed at school and we outline that expectation. Uh, I think that that message will really be taken to heart. Uh, my second question. I think so too. One more yeah, thing, Mr. Press, as you know, in working with Liz Payne and the health staff, we coordinate a lot with them so that it's multiple opportunities to be talking about this. It's during the beginning of the year, SR and R expectations. It's during health class. It's really a school-wide effort, the work with the student leaders, right. our I messaging. Think the, I think the youth survey is a big key there, and, and any way we can incorporate that into targeted approaches at the campus level about what the specific risk factors are there, uh, the more effective that that will be. My second question is, uh, you know, we had a discussion earlier to Ms. Corbett Sanders' point about these mandatory referrals. And, you know, I could be wrong here, but what I was thinking through this was, for all of these offenses, what we may have been trying to ensure was equity in reporting, that, you know, if these things are occurring, that they're going to be reported so we can have an equitable treatment of these cases. Um, in the absence of these mandatory referrals for these, and some of these are very serious offenses, um, or can be, how are we ensuring that equity in reporting from the school, you know, to VDOE or to the, to the hearings office, et cetera? So um, there is a process between IT and the schools that looks through all of the things that are entered into SIS. And sometimes you need to do some cleanup because um, it just doesn't make sense what is in there. And you go back and say, this must have been the wrong code, whatever. The report to VDOE is done by IT. So it's not done by individual schools. It's collectively done after a cleaning process, if you will, of the data. So, um, beyond that, uh, you know, again, it is part of our process now that we meet with all of the principals at the beginning of the year and go through all of the pieces of the SRNR that we, anything especially if we feel like there's been inconsistency from school to school. So those are just the practices we're doing. Now we're down to me. So um, I'm going to try to be specific in some of my questions. Can we go to slide 11, please? So is there a, and I don't know who can answer this question, and if it's a legal question from a, from a law enforcement or if it's from a VDOE policy, uh, is the requirement to report these, is there a degree of specificity enough that from jurisdiction to jurisdiction around the Commonwealth, the same things for the same level are being reported so we are comparing apples to apples? To the extent that any data is clean, yes. So in other words, it's very clear what needs to be reported. Um, and each of those things are defined as, as what needs to be reported. Where our IT would say things sometimes get a little difficult is that we may, in Fairfax County, have two or three offenses that need to be rolled together to meet the state definition because for whatever reasons, we've divided it out more specifically in our SRNR. So it could be that one a student commits like you know something and in that series of something there's the one thing that has to be reported to VDOE so it all gets reported or it gets reported as one incident okay. okay and commander do you have discussions with peers is there a way to have discussions with peers across the commonwealth is there ever any like cross jurisdictional not as often as you might think between us. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I rarely, in my career, and I don't know, other than the chief level and those highest levels, they don't, we don't at our level do too much with other, yeah, we don't. We have classes where they might engage, there's a police executive leadership school that takes place in Richmond. I think there's one in uh, Roanoke where people at my level or above, you know, commander level will go and they'll have a 
week for three months, one week each month, where they, they talk about all kinds of stuff. But is it like specific forms? I'm sure there are, through whether it's the Association of Chief of Police or other stuff, but I've never been a part of one, so I don't know. The reason I ask is, is for slide, if we can see slide 14, it dovetails into my next question. So on the right-hand column are those who are trained are these people who volunteer to train? Do we define who has to be trained? Um, is this um, is there uh, um, uh, um, a spread across the division? Are there pockets of training? You know, Dr. Garza, in terms of you know uh, pockets of excellence, you know, is this predominantly middle school? I mean, who 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 represents those numbers, and how or why? It's a combination. Um, what we try to do is put out the charts for principals. So whether you're elementary, middle, or high school, no matter what you teach, if you teach Cat A, if you teach, teach Cat B students, students with or without disabilities, we list all the recommended trainings and then work with the principals through our associations about what's required, what's not. I will tell you in the last two years, we've made a lot of progress in sending IAs and PHAs and PHTAs to training, which is free training. But do we track, do we track like the, the um, distribution of these people being trained across the division? Like do we, are we able to determine, look, there's people in a building and there's more people trained in this building and not versus the incidents that happen in the building to see if there is a correlation between the professional development we're offering the professional development people are taking advantage of and having a concentration in a building and whether it's actually resulting in something. I mean, and Ms. Corbett Sanders would appreciate you know, the, what I'm trying to get to, which is, are we offering the professional development that they need? Are they taking advantage <coughs> of it? And is it at a building level making a difference? And are we able to say, well, there's not enough people in this building being trained and we're seeing the product of it, so we need more people in this building train. That's a good question. The We've put into effect recently, and I would say a work in progress over the last two years of two things. One is my PLT, which has been with us for a while, where you personally record everything because that helps you with your recertification. So every five years when you recertify, it's a nice list under each category of how you're gonna to qualify to recertify. But we've also been sharing more attendance lists because we're able to list per section everybody who attends and those go to the regions and those go to the schools. Okay. So there so, is that way to check. So I think uh, Ms. Schultz uh, is onto something in terms of something we've talked about a lot and that is making very explicit what we expect school-based staff to get trained in. So in some cases it's specific maybe to a special program up, you know that you're seeing here but for an example restorative justice I think we could easily connect the dots like you just described we've done a lot of training we have intentionally made sure we have people trained at every secondary school and we're still building that program and then we've subsequently seen a significant increase in restorative justice being used right so I get I get your point and I think moving forward we need to be make be able to connect those dots in the way in which you described. That's exactly, that's exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. Okay, um, just a couple of One other. more thing, Ms. Schultz. Oh. Um, our angel of autism, for instance, Tina Wilkerson, you, you heard me refer to that before, and that's an editorial statement, but most of the county would agree with me in that opinion. Um, we're also asking program specialists to work with the principals to make sure that people have the right training for the right students that they serve. And I do think that that's important, particularly with um, the proclivity for students with disabilities to wind up in the in the discipline system. So just a couple um, uh, last things. One, I do recall asking, when you said that this is everything we asked for, I remember asking for a disaggregation between male and female and secondary schools to not secondary schools. And I didn't see any of that. So um, I'm going to put that up as a follow on. Um, I will say that I think the level of interest that's shown here necessitated this work session. Um, I do have a question for, um, well, I have a point to make for Ms. Hines um, in the question about uncomfortableness for principals. I did a lot of work with Mr. Paris um, as he was transitioning and doing this work um, for Dr. Garza when she came on board. 
And th that is precisely what he, how he characterized it. He said that the principals were uncomfortable with the notion of use. And I mean, that, that, that was very clear um, that it was a question of comfort. And I do think that Ms. McLaughlin has a point around um, it, just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean we need to keep doing it this way. And, uh, and the reason I bring that up, and Dr. Garza, this is for you, is the question of, you know, are we treating possession and use differently, which we are? Is Arlington doing it? No. Um, is it required by law? No. And um, when you get down to a statutory weapon, we treat possession and use of a statutory weapon, you know, it's, it's called out uh, that way in our SR&R. We link them together, possession and use of a statutory weapon. So whether it's possession or it's use, you know, is linked together. And so I do think the, um, that there is enough evidence when you talk about nearly a 90% non-recidivism rate in a, a neighboring jurisdiction, that reduces cost to us. And that's where, I mean, again, you know, in some respect, we gotta get to monetizing this. It saves us money. It saves the public money when you keep kids out of the pipeline to prison, if you will, and keep them on an academic path that um, keeps their trajectory towards graduation, uh, reduces their involvement in the hearings office and in the discipline process, keeps them in class, keeps them uh, academically inclined. So um, I, I, I do think that we've got to have um, this discussion if it's, if it, if it's warranted you know, beyond this if we need to. If, if some people are still at a comfort level, that's okay. I'm okay with that. But um, we're not talking about, this is not an emotional decision. This is a data-driven decision. And I think there is substantive enough data from not only the health and mental well, well-being of the students, but also from a monetary aspect of, you know what, this keeps them on the right path and produces, you know, um, effective citizens in our community um, at a greater level than um, than uh, those who recidivize. So, um, I don't. I didn't hear any other next steps other than my own. I do have um, two quick go backs. We are already uh, 12 minutes over for this amount. I would like to in four minutes be at a hard stop, um, mostly to respect uh, people's time who have come to join us for this um, work session. So quickly, Ms. McLaughlin and then Ms. Karen Corbett-Sanders. So as Dr. Lip knows, I really am trying to find a, a path to yes that gets everybody on the same page. And so Dr. Garza, I, I did want to share with not only my colleagues, but for you that I, being the daughter of a former teacher and assistant principal, I know how important it is that we empower and demonstrate our confidence in their leadership. We currently give confidence and, and leadership discretion on mob assault, sex assault, and distribution of alcohol and inhalants. So I, I hope that any amendment I might consider will continue to have that reinforcement and reassurance to our principals that we respect their discretion. Um, the beauty of Fairfax County's program, it's actually far more structured um, and have safety measures in place than maybe Arlington's, although Arlington's we've shown is very successful, is our program is required to go to an expedited review. So for my colleagues where you might be just trying to get yourselves comfortable with this, and I don't know else how to say it because 90% you know, success and not non-recidivism is, is really good. Um, but Dr. Garza, the, the only change here would be that your division would still have the expedited review decision making. If, if a use case came to the division and it was determined that, you know what, there's other extenuating circumstances, we still want this to go to the hearings office, the opportunity is there. What I'm asking you all to consider is that first use along with possession, still gets the expedited review option, which is what's been going on with the division council. Um, but as much as everybody keeps talking about what research, evidence, and everything that is kind of, I feel, on the onus of me to bring to the table, I think it is just as important to say, 
all right, I've brought you the success of Arlington, and I will be happy to bring criminal justice experts to the conversation before we vote on any possible amendments. But let's remember the same onus is on where is the evidence that what we're doing now is supposedly better for our kids. And to Ms. Hines' point, thank you for capturing it, and I wanna clarify, you and I are very much on the same page. This is as much about what is best for the individual student as what will be best for our student body. And um, you know, Ms. Schultz is, is correct that what we do here is to benefit each and every student in whatever situation they find themselves and trying to get them to help them make better decisions is what this is all about. Okay, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, I'm sorry I left the room, but just wanted to uh, come back to a discussion that I had raised before about the student rights and concerns when they feel that something is not being addressed. Um, I appreciate you pointing, it, having this handout, but if we read the handout and it doesn't really address it in the elementary, um, but it does address it in the middle and high, it says you have a right to ask questions and to complain if you believe a decision made by staff members is not in your best interest. But um, sometimes it may not be a decision made, but an action taken by a staff member that um, is not in a student's best interest. And so I would suggest that you might want to modify that to read decision or action. Um, and then I went back and I read your append the reference there, which is Appendix D, page 8. And I'm a little concerned that it really doesn't necessarily give the same level of specificity of what people can expect from um, when a complaint is made regarding a uh, decision or action, action or inaction of a staff member that, uh, you know, it does say the principal may require the parent. Uh, it says that the principal shall notify in writing on some cases, but we're not really specific in what parents can expect when they have a challenge. And this is a concern that somebody had brought to me, actually two different parents had, that we're not as clear about that process as we are clear about the process when a child has done something and gotten in a bit of trouble. Uh, and I guess my question would be, are you talking about um, when they disagree with something that's been done within the discipline system? No. When something so, occurs to a child where maybe they themselves have experienced either some bullying or harassment or um, a situation where, uh, you know, pardon me, when they're, the when they're the victim. And and we have a very clear process for that. It's just not in the SRNR. So I, I so, but when parents go looking for it, they don't know where to look for that process. And so that's where, it, if it's not here, because the immediate thought is student rights. Mm -hmm. So if they have a right to raise an issue because they feel like they're a victim, then we need to point to what their right is and how they go about getting it resolved. Okay. Um, it may belong in the front of the book. I'm not sure it belongs within the regulation about discipline, but we can certainly. Yeah, because most people, I think, when point, they I think what stone. you mean is pointing them to the play. You know, I think just yeah. at the beginning, if we can add some statements about pointing them to, to where they would go to know how to respond mm -hmm. to those. Is that what you're saying, Ms. Corbett Sanders? Because okay. what it says here is you have a right to complain, and it points me to Appendix D, page 8, and it doesn't point me to resolving a situation if my child feels like they're a victim of something. Again, I think when that was written, it was written within the discipline context. How do you complain? Yeah. And, and so, so, but the front of the book includes many other things that are not specific to the discipline process. So we can certainly put more information in there. That would be very helpful just because it kind of balances out that it's rights and responsibilities. Okay, um, do we have next steps? Okay. Yeah, 
And that was just a, um, that was actually a leftover from the Thursday. Um, secondary schools to, mm -hmm, to just see if there's a difference. Well, no, no, the, sec, the secondary model to the non-secondary model. To the comprehensive high school model, right? Secondary at your three sites versus the other schools? Correct? Whatever language you'll understand. Okay. <laughs> it's not for me. It's That's for good. you. Okay. Miss um, Corbett-Sanders? Which is? Okay, she's she's going to come over and tell you in person because Schultz, we, we know what that is. Yes, uh, specifically for the disaggregated data that you want. Do you want suspensions? What what data is it you want disaggregated? I I think that it's just a top level view of look at look at what the. Um, discipline numbers are in a secondary scenario versus middle school to, because I'm trying to get back down to the seventh to 10th grade. Seventh to 10th grade, seventh to 10th grade boys, seventh to 10th grade boys who are minorities, seventh to 10th grade boys who are, um, who have disabilities. Ms. Schultz, I think about, how about this? If they were to disaggregate it by um, referrals for to the hearings office, mm -hmm. and then uh, suspension. Okay. Is that okay? That would be fine. Those two major. I, I, I think what I'm looking for is a snapshot to okay. see is there a difference, and if there is, is there something that we can learn from that? Because we know, again, we know where the problem is. And Ms. McLaughlin, did you have a next step? Uh, yes, I do. But weren't you you wanting to look at seventh through tenth graders, not just the high school numbers nine through twelve? They 12? know what I'm looking for. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. The, the comparison of what happens in a middle school t transition to high school versus when they're together mm -hmm. and sort of inculcated into the program of expectations that exist within a secondary model. Okay, so um, my request uh, has to do with um, slide one in the responses. It was the graph that was referrals to the hearings office. Um, because the reassignment reconsiderations and exclusion recommendations, which is exclusion supposed to be expulsion? Or what is that? I mean, what is it? How is reassignment different from exclusion? What that graph, if you want to go back to the graph, it should have been yeah, graph the very first one. one. The hearings office does three types of cases we have referrals to the division superintendent, that's for school based misconduct, it could result in expulsion. Then we have recommendations for reassignment, specifically for um, charges in the community. It cannot result in an expulsion. Exclusions are a separate category altogether, and that's for a student who has been expelled or long-term suspended elsewhere, and they're seeking to enroll in Fairfax County Public Schools during the term of that expulsion or long-term suspension. Okay, so the red line, though, is any time you guys from the hearings office are recommending a reassignment? No. The red line is any time a school sends a case to us on the basis of a criminal charge related to community-based crimes. So where's our chart on our, our normal involuntary reassignments that come out of your hearings office? Where you would see that is in the annual report because that's a decision. If you look at the blue line, mm -hmm. that's the school-based misconduct. Anything that happens at school, it could result in a return to school, it could result in a reassignment to an alternative setting, it could result in an expulsion. Well, I, I gotta tell you, I've got a concern with this chart because since it's a public document and the public's gonna look at it, it really isn't clear. I mean, I'm as a school board member reading this and thinking. I, I that would agree. I think Ms. what Miss McLaughlin, the point she's trying to make is, is that the vernacular that's understood in the community is that reassignment is is understood to be a student being reassigned. Because you and said so, the blue line is our line. 
the, the blue line is what is Referral, being sent. Referrals, referrals from the building right. to right. So the hearings office. Yeah. Hearings so office. I got to tell you, then maybe create another purple line, but something should be based on this blue line is who's coming to your office from our principals, and then where's the line that says what your your how many are you re re recommending for reassignment? Because that that's reassignment recommendation based on a criminal charge. Right. This data that was put together today was specifically put together to answer Mr. Moon's discreet question. The hearings office annual report, which you've received, it's posted on the public web, it is meant for public consumption, is a 27 page report that, that's, it includes that's, all yep. of that data no problem I, I think, no I problem think, i think if we're going to get to what 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 the next step should be and um and to close this out i i think that this slide potentially needs a little bit more clarity in the labels because of how how these terms are interpreted in the community these are known terms so i think reassignment recommendations doesn't quite cover it um so would it be sufficient to say um, uh, provide clarity to the referrals to the hearing office slide and then you all know what we're talking about um, because th if this is going to be posted for the public I agree there does have to be some clarity to that in 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 terms of how it's understood would that be all right sure okay okay is that it okay well we're um, 28 minutes over so but thank you. So, um, yeah, yes, we're all yes. set. It yes. is lunch time, uh, right? So everybody happy with being back here at 1.30? Sure. 20 minutes, OK. <laughs> thank you all very much. That catches us up by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. 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 Oh